Black Hound of Death, Chapter 4 The Hound of Satan Crouching in the shadows, I circled the little clearing to reach a side of the cabin which was without a window. In the thick darkness, with no gleam of light to reveal me, I glided out from the trees and approached the building. Near the wall, I stumbled over something bulky and yielding, and almost went to my knees, my heart shooting into my throat with the fear of the noise betraying me. But the ghastly laughter still belled horribly from inside the cabin, mingled with the whimpering of a human voice. It was Ashley I had stumbled over, or rather, his body. He lay on his back, staring sightlessly upward, his head lolling back on the red ruin of his neck. His throat had been torn out. From chin to collar it was a great, gaping, ragged wound. His garments were slimy with blood. Slightly sickened, in spite of my experience with violent deaths, I glided to the cabin wall and sought without success for a crevice between the logs. The laughter had ceased in the cabin, and that frightful, inhuman voice was ringing out, making the nerves quiver in the backs of my hands. With the same difficulty that I had experienced before, I made out the words. And so they did not kill me, the black monks of Ehrlich. They preferred a jest, a delicious jest, from their point of view. Merely to kill me would be too kind. They thought it more humorous to play with me a while, as cats do with a mouse, and then send me back into the world with a mark I could never erase. The brand of the hound. That's what they called it, and they did their job well indeed. None knows better than they how to alter a man. Black magic? Bah! Those devils are the greatest scientists in the world. What little the Western world knows about science has leaked out in little trickles from those black mountains. Those devils could conquer the world if they wanted to. They know things that no modern even dares to guess. They know more about plastic surgery, for instance, than all the scientists of the world put together. They understand glands as no European or American understands them. They know how to retard or exercise them so as to produce certain results. God, what results! Look at me! Look, damn you, and go mad! I glided about the cabin until I reached a window and peered through a crack in the shutter. Richard Brent lay on a divan in a room incongruously richly furnished for that primitive setting. He was bound hand and foot. His face was livid and scarcely human. In his starting eyes was the look of a man who had at last come face to face with ultimate horror. Across the room from him, the girl, Gloria, was spread eagled on a table, held helpless with cords on her wrists and ankled. She was stark naked, her clothing lying in scattered confusion on the floor as if they had been brutally ripped from her. Her head was twisted about as she stared in wide-eyed horror at the tall figure which dominated the scene. He stood with his back toward the window where I crouched as he faced Richard Brent. To all appearances, this figure was human, the figure of a tall, spare man in dark, close-fitting garments, with a sort of cape hanging from his lean, wide shoulders. But at the sight, a strange trembling took hold of me, and I recognized at last the dread I had felt since I first glimpsed that gaunt form on the shadowy trail above the body of poor Jim Tyke. There was something unnatural about the figure, something not apparent as he stood there with his back to me, yet an unmistakable suggestion of abnormality, and my feelings were the dread and loathing that normal men naturally feel toward the abnormal. They made me the horror I am today, and then drove me forth. He was yammering in his horrible, mouthing voice. But the change was not made in a day or a month or a year. They played with me, as devils play with a screaming soul, on the white hot grids of hell. Time and again I would have died in spite of them, but I was upheld by the thought of vengeance. Through the long black year shot red with torture and agony. I dreamed of the day when I would pay the debt I owed to you, Richard Brent. You spawn of Satan's vilest gutter. So at last the hunt began. 
When I reached New York, I sent you a photograph of my... my face. And a letter detailing what had happened. And what... would... happen. Did you think you could escape me? Do you think I would have warned you? If I were not sure of my prey? I wanted you to suffer with the knowledge of your doom. To live in terror. To flee and hide like a hunted wolf. You fled, and I hunted you from coast to coast. You did temporarily give me the slip when you came here, but it was inevitable that I should smell you out. When the black monks of Yalgon gave me this. His hand seemed to stab at his face, and Richard Brent cried out slobberingly. They also instilled in my nature something of the spirit of the beast copied to kill you was not enough I wished to glut my vengeance to the last shuddering outs that is why I sent a telegram to your niece the one person in the world that you cared for my plans worked out perfectly with one exception the bandages I have worn ever since I left Yalgon were displaced by a branch, and I had to kill the fool who was guiding me to your cabin. No man looks upon my face and lives, except Tope Braxton, who is more like an ape than a man anyway. I fell in with him shortly after I was fired at by the man Garfield, when I took him into my confidence, recognizing a valuable ally. He is too brutish to feel the same horror at my appearance than the other Negro felt. He thinks I am a demon of some sort, but so long as I am not hostile toward him, he sees no reason why he should not ally himself with me. It was fortunate I took him in, for it was he who struck down Garfield as he was returning. I would have already killed Garfield myself, but he was too strong, too handy with his gun. You might have learned a lesson from these people, Richard Brent. They live hardily and violently, and they are tough and dangerous as timber wolves. But you, you are soft and over-civilized. You will die far too easily. I wish you were as hard as Garfield was. I would like to keep you alive for days to suffer. I gave Garfield a chance to get away. But the fool came back and had to be dealt with. That bomb I threw through the window would have had little effect upon him. It contained one of the chemical secrets I managed to learn in Mongolia. But it is effective only in relation to the bodily strength of the victim. It was enough to knock out a girl and a soft, pampered, degenerate like you. But Ashley was able to stagger out of the cabin and would quickly have gained his full powers if I had not come upon him and put him beyond power of harm. Brent lifted a moaning cry. There was no intelligence in his eyes, only a ghastly fear. Foam flew from his lips. He was mad. Mad as the fearful being that posed and yammered in that room of horror. Only the girl writhing pitifully on that ebony table was sane. All else was madness and nightmare. And suddenly, complete delirium overcame Adam Grimm and the laboring monotones shattered in a heart-stopping scream. Fast the girl! shrieked Adam Grimm, or the thing that had been Adam Grimm. The girl! To be slain as I have seen women slain in Mongolia! To be skinned alive slowly! Oh, so slowly! She shall bleed to make you suffer, Richard Brent! Suffer as I suffered in Black Yalgon. She shall not die until there is no longer an inch of skin left on her body below her neck. Watch me flay your beloved niece, Richard Brent. I do not believe Richard Brent comprehended. He was beyond understanding anything. He yammered gibberish, tossing his head from side to side spattering foam from his livid working lips. I was lifting a revolver, but just then Adam Grimm whirled, and the sight of his face froze me into paralysis. 
What unguessed masters of nameless science dwell in the black towers of Yalgon? I dare not dream. But surely, black sorcery from the pits of hell went into the remolding of that countenance. Ears, forehead, and eyes were those of an ordinary man. But the nose, mouth, and jaws were such as men have not even imagined in nightmares. I find myself unable to find adequate descriptive phrases. They were hideously elongated, like the muzzle of an animal. There was no chin. Upper and lower jaws jutted like the jaws of a hound or a wolf. And the teeth, bared by the snarling bestial lips, were gleaming fangs. How those jaws managed to frame human words I cannot guess. But the change was deeper than superficial appearance. In his eyes, which blazed like coals of hell's fire, was a glare that never shone from any human's eyes, sane or mad. When the black devil monks of Yalgon altered Adam Grimm's face, they wrought a corresponding change in his soul. He was no longer a human being. He was a veritable werewolf, as terrible as any in medieval legend. The thing that had been Adam Grimm rushed toward the girl, a curved skinning knife gleaming in his hand, and I shook myself out of my days of horror and fired through the hole in the shutter. My aim was unerring. I saw the cape jerk to the impact of the slug, and at the crash of the shot the monster staggered and the knife fell from his hand. Then instantly he whirled and dashed back across the room toward Richard Brent. With lightning comprehension he realized what had happened. He knew he could take only one victim with him and made his choice instantly. I do not believe that I can logically be blamed for what happened. I might have smashed that shutter, leaped into the room, and grappled with the thing that the monks of Inner Mongolia had made of Adam Grimm. But so swiftly did the monster move that Richard Brent would have died anyway before I could have burst into the room. I did what seemed the only obvious thing. I poured lead through the window into that loping horror as it crossed the room. That should have halted it, should have crashed it down dead on the floor. But Adam Grimm plunged on, heedless of the slugs ripping into him. His vitality was more than human, more than bestial. There was something demoniac about him, invoked by the black arts that made him what he was. No natural creature could have crossed that room under that raking hail of close-range lead. At that distance I could not miss. He reeled at each impact, but he did not fall until I had smashed home the sixth bullet. Then he crawled on, beast-like, on hands and knees, froth and blood dripping from his grinning jaws. Panic swept me. Frantically, I snatched the second gun and emptied it into that body that writhed painfully onward, spattering blood at every movement. But all hell could not keep Adam Grimm from his prey, and death itself shrank from the ghastly determination in that once human soul. With twelve bullets in him, literally shot to pieces, his brains oozing from a great hole in his temple, Adam Grimm reached the man on the divan. The misshapen head dipped. A scream gurgled in Richard Brent's throat as the hideous jaws locked. For a mad instant, those two frightful visages seemed to melt together to my horrified sight. The mad human and the mad inhuman. Then with a wild beast gesture, Grimm threw up his head, ripping out his enemy's jugular, and blood deluged both figures. Grimm lifted his head with his dripping fangs and bloody muzzle, and his lips writhed back in a last peal of ghastly laughter that choked in a rush of blood as he crumpled and lay still. End of section 4. <laughs>